Okay, so far we have seen how GMAT reading comprehension is very different from the reading comprehension that we do in everyday life, like reading the morning newspaper or reading your favorite article in a magazine. What we will do now is we will see how mapping essentially helps address the five issues that we saw initially. The five challenges that we had, so the first thing that we need to do when we are looking at mapping is we need to make sure that our timing strategy is such that we spend no more than two to three minutes actively reading and mapping the passage. This is the first time. And then you spend about four to five minutes answering the questions. If you see, we are actually recommending that you spend twice as much time answering the questions than reading or mapping the passage. The first shot reading mapping should be very uh, quick. You should get on to it and net net you should spend no more than six to eight minutes. It's very very important that you keep this number in mind. See for any other section let's say critical reasoning or uh, sentence correction at best you know they can end up taking maybe a minute more. But this is where you have to understand reading comprehension is very different you can end up consuming 10 to 12 minutes and we can't afford that kind of luxury on the GMAT, right? Six to eight minutes is all that we have, okay? And a lot of times what may happen is you will realize that even if I end up, let's say um, I am on question number 31, right? And uh, let us say I have 57 minutes done, okay? 57 minutes over, I have already completed question number 31, which means I have 10 questions left and uh, 18 minutes left. Now, if you realize this is a fairly good situation for you to be in because roughly this works out to about 108 seconds per question. And if you were to look at it, we have about 109 seconds per question. So net net, you are doing very well if you are at this kind of a scenario. Now what happens is if I get a RC passage that really torments me and I really take let's say a couple of minutes more to read the passage. So instead of taking let's say three minutes I end up taking three plus two five minutes to read the passage. Okay and uh, let us say I take uh, slightly more so there are three questions and let us say I take two minutes per question correct net net let me say six minutes for answering right so five minutes for reading the passage six minutes for answering which means I spend let's say 11 minutes on the next RC passage so think about it I'm on question number 31 I see an RC passage and I end up spending slightly more because I am mentally fatigued three questions I end up spending 11 minutes 6, 5 over here and 6 over here. So I end up spending 11 minutes. What does that mean? It means I am left for the remaining 7 questions. I am left with just 7 minutes. Do you realize how from a position of apparent strength, I can be reduced to a position where I start panicking because 7 questions cannot be done in 7 minutes. Right? And if you look at it, I hardly took a couple of minutes over here and a couple of minutes over here. So that's one of the reasons why it is very important that you spend only six to eight minutes per passage answering all the questions. Going back to what I said earlier, if you are taking more time on the GMAT, it is not the diagnosis, this is not the problem itself, it is the symptom of a bigger problem. Right? So it's like if you have a headache, the problem is not the headache, the headache is a symptom of a bigger problem. So taking more time is usually a problem that lies with reading comprehension and I have seen as I said 9 out of 10 cases the problem is we end up consuming a few more minutes reading the passage that eventually costs us in the longer run. So be careful on this part. The second challenge is working around the confusing content part, right? So what I recommend over here is don't go through the motions, just focus. It's a treasure hunt. It's a treasure hunt for the topic sentence. 
So what I'm going to do when I look at a passage is I am focused on finding that one thing that the author is trying to say. So I try to cut through the details and I just say, okay, you know, what does it all mean? What does it mean for me? What is it that one thing that the author is trying to say that I can put on my map? And that is why a map helps you. A map helps you because you don't get bogged down by the details, right? Whatever is important, whatever is the main idea is what we are capturing in our maps. So what I have over here is something that is slightly counterintuitive, okay? In life, if I read something and I don't understand, I perhaps am going to go back, read it again and ensure that I have understood it. But on the GMAT, if I read something and I don't understand, it's a lot of details, it's technical, then I'm probably not going to get into it. I'm probably going to gloss over it. So think about it this way. Let's say that you are driving a geared vehicle. First gear is when you consume the most fuel. But that is the one that is also the, you know, the best way, right, in terms of it is the most powerful gear to be on. On the other hand, you have a fourth gear. Fourth gear, you'll go very fast, but you'll also consume very little fuel. On the GMAT, when things are tough, don't go on first gear. Go on fourth gear, which means don't invest too much time if you're not able to understand something counterintuitively invest less time because you're not able to understand it. So many times what may happen is I'm just going through a passage and I just read something and I said, well, you know, this stuff that I'm not able to figure out. I said, you know, no problem. Let me just go ahead. The main point that he's trying to say is he's giving an example of how things will not work. As long as I get that level of understanding, I'm more than happy. The third challenge is handling stress. So there are two parts to it. The first part to it is the part where we have mental fatigue, right? So the first thing you have to understand is GMAT is a three and a half hour long test. Let's accept it and let's work around it. Let's not try to, you know, play this game where we wish that GMAT had reading comprehension before we had quant. Well, there is wishful thinking because on the GMAT, we just had to accept that reading comprehension, especially the fourth passage, is going to come at the end of three and a half hours, right? So one thing that you can do is you can make your prep sessions longer, make it more rigorous and take more full length tests. That's very important that you mentally prepare yourself for reading comprehension. Again, going back to what I said about reading comprehension being different when we solve questions from the OG and solving, question, uh, solving the passages when we see them on the test, is the way the brain works is very, very different when I'm going to take an OG passage and just generally go through it, answer a couple of questions towards the end, right? Very, very different than the situation that we saw earlier where on, <clears throat> where on question number 31 at the end of three hours your brain is under a lot of stress. One thing that you can do is perhaps you can prepare yourself in advance by ensuring that you do reading comprehension towards the end of your prep session. Do quant, do sentence correction, do critical reasoning, and in the end, do reading comprehension, right? So your prep strategy can be uh, structured that way. The second thing that I recommend is Take more full length tests. See, what happens is your brain in some sense tunes itself, correct? It's like running a marathon. If today you were to run a marathon, probably you would not be able to run more than a kilometer, correct? But as you keep running, as you keep improving your stamina, your endurance, you will realize that you would be able to do a lot more. That's exactly what we do when we prepare ourselves for reading comprehension. Right? So when we start off, maybe our stamina is not as great as we would like it to be, but towards the end, it gets to a point where we are able to comfortably do all the four passages on the test. The last one is ensuring that you don't indulge in these what if scenarios, right? What if, you know, this happens, maybe I don't like a particular kind of passage. If you don't like it, don't worry, you have that passage, you have to solve it, right? So. Don't get into these self-fulfilling prophecies. It is not going to help anyone. Fourth one is how you manage reading speeds. So the way I want, to, I want you to look at it is this way, correct? If there are 100 pages to read 
and let us say there are only 50 page hours to read them right and we have we can read only one page per hour so let me kind of put the things back in in perspective you have 100 pages and we have 50 hours to read them and you can read only one page per hour now think about it on the gmat the time required is going to be constant which means you cannot possibly do it any faster which means you have to spend 50 hours we cannot spend 55 hours we cannot spend 100 hours time is a constant speed is also a constant <coughs> We cannot read faster, I just told you that that is one of the limitations. What really it means is, I cannot afford reading 100 pages, I have to read less, I have to read only 50 pages. And this is where you're really, your thinking has to change. Uh, going back to what we said in critical reading, not all sentences are created equal. Right? Some sentences are more important than the others. So when you look at it as 100 pages, in our mind, we assume that all 100 pages are equal. No. Of these 100 pages, 50 are important, 50 are unimportant. So the real deal is figuring out those 50 pages that are important. The last one is how to answer correctly. If you remember what we said, all that you read is of no use unless and until you are able to answer the questions correctly and here is where I want you to think about it when we read on the GMAT we are essentially going to be reading it in a different style each time the first time when we don't know what question we are trying to answer we are just trying to get an overall view of what the passage is we call it skimming right so you're just reading it quickly getting an idea of what it is Suppose that when you hit the questions, you are going to go back to the passage and try to see what the answer to that particular question is. We are going to be looking at very specific things in the passage that is going to help us answer the question. This is called scanning. So if you realize we are actually reading it in two different ways. The first time when I'm reading it, it's like reading a morning newspaper, right? So I just pick it up, I just go through it. I don't know what I'm really looking for. I'm just trying to absorb that information. It is called skimming, right? But if you were to look at uh, yellow pages, if you're looking at a telephone directory, right? And you're just trying to scan for a particular name, you're trying to find a particular name that is called scanning. On the GMAT, you will realize that we are going to be doing both skimming and scanning. The first time that we read it, we will be doing skimming and then subsequently when we start answering the questions, we are going to do scanning, right? So it kind of works uh, in tandem, it, it works together. The key point that you need to remember is whenever we read, we get the sense of, you know, I have to read this, I have to make sure that I understand all the details. I want you to take a deep breath and tell yourself, do not worry, I will be reading the passage a minimum of two times, correct? If there is any detail, that particular point can always be revisited. We can always get back to it when we do scanning. Most people end up spending way too much time on skimming because they feel that I have to remember everything. I need to know what exactly is being said. But if you do critical reading, you focus on the structure and you leave the details to when you do scanning. So the biggest advantage of this is when you read it, you are going to keep telling yourself, don't worry, this is like a reconnaissance mission, right? So what happens in a reconnaissance mission is that you fly over the enemy territory, just getting an overview of the topography, just giving an overview of how things are laid out, right? That is what you do in skimming. And when you actually get down to answering questions is when you're going to go and get to that particular place that you want to go, right? <clears throat> so the other analogy to this is think of yourself as a bird that is circling, you know, a field, trying to look for where things are, you know. And uh, the moment you have found your prey, what you do is just kind of stoop down, you pick your prey and you got your kill. That's what you do when you do scanning, right? Going back to the first thing, gist. What is gist? General information. 
we saw how to get general information that is by figuring out the topic sentence the second thing is structure what you do here you will be able to get a very good very good idea of the structure the details of it we can always come back to when we are answering questions we will be discussing the third part tone in a subsequent video when we see how something is said is very different than what is what it is said about now i want you to take this passage i want you to take 3 minutes okay so take a deep breath and i am going to say start at that point you can say you can start the passage make sure you create a map and try to answer all the questions start now Thirty seconds over. We have another two and a half minutes. Remember, you have to understand the crux of the passage and try to write it in your own words. Go on, a minute almost over. Another two minutes on. Remember that not only do you need to read the passage, but you also need to be answering the questions in your own words. We are close to the halfway mark. So ninety seconds over. Ninety more left. Read fast. I'll be measuring your base speed of reading. and uh, two minutes over so you have just one more minute left remember you cannot mute the audio so keep reading try to focus you also need to answer the questions 45 seconds left for all the three paragraphs you need to be writing your crux 30 seconds left try to do it faster try to answer all the questions time is ticking away just about another 15 seconds left last 10 second countdown 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 one stop all right so were you able to do it in 3 minutes or did you feel that uh, though you knew that you had to go in fourth gear at some point you still ended up going in the first gear so were you able to answer the questions uh, do you think you like this topic or was this topic too dense right a lot of questions so let's do it this way let me go and let me show you how i would have approached this passage so let me create a map okay and based on that we will try to see whether you got uh, you know were you thinking in the same direction are you in the same line so first up what i'm going to do is i'm going to read it um let me just go through it it says how many people really suffer as a result of labor market problems very honestly i don't know what labor market problems are um so i'm just going to read on this is one of the most significant yet controversial social policy questions in many ways our social statistics exaggerate the degree of hardship hold on you know let me just go back one of the most significant you know what 
I get a very good sense that the topic sentence is over here. We are talking about whether labor market problem can be measured and uh, you know how this question has to be answered. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of uh, take a step back and I'm going to start writing my map. Um, so I'm going to say this is about labor market problem. Remember what I told you, you don't need to wait for the end of the passage to, uh, or end of the paragraph to write the map. If you feel that you have a lot of data and you can start off, you can perhaps create the map <clears throat> even in the first few sentences. Let me go back. Um, in many ways, our social statistics exaggerate the degree of hardship and unemployment does not have the same bleak consequences today as it did in the 1930s when most of the unemployed were primary breadwinners when income and earnings were usually much closer to the margin of subsistence and when there were no countervailing social programs for those failing in the labor market. You know, very honestly, a lot of words, finding it very hard. Um, let me just go on. Increasing affluence, the rise of families with more than one wage earner, the growing predominance of secondary earners among the unemployed and improved social welfare protection have unquestionably mitigated the consequences of joblessness. Earnings and income data also overstate the dimensions of hardship. Now, <clears throat> let me just try to understand. See, it says social statistics exaggerate, correct? So it is not as bad as it looks. Correct. Then he goes on to say that uh, they don't have the same bleak consequences today. The other thing that caught my attention was this, that they overstate the dimension of hardship. Mitigate means make it less worse. So mitigated the consequences of joblessness. So net net the feeling that I'm getting from here is there are these social statistics and uh, apparently this kind of exaggerates, they, they, they exaggerate the hardship among the millions with early uh, hourly earnings uh, at or below the minimum wage level, the overwhelming majority. You know what, at this point, I'm not really getting into the details. I really have no idea what secondary earners are, uh, what happens if they are unemployed. It's a lot of data for me to handle. And honestly, unless and until I have a PhD in this topic, there's no way I'm going to be able to read this and understand all of it in the first go, correct? So I'm just reading through this. Most of those counted by poverty statistics are elderly or handicapped and have family responsibilities which keep them out of the labor force. So the poverty statistics are no means accurate indicator of labor market pathologies. At this point, the only thing that I've understood really is there are a bunch of social statistics and he's saying that they are not a very good way to measure what we started measuring, which is labor market problems. Now, when I start the second paragraph, and this is where critical reading kicks in, I look at the first word and it says, yet. The moment I see the word yet, I realize that what is happening over here is he's going to give you a counterpoint, right? So let me just read it. It says, yet there are also many ways our social statistics underestimate the degree of labor market related hardships. So now this is my topic sentence. The moment I've realized that the earlier paragraph spoke about how it was exaggerated, this topic is talking about how it is underestimating. Let me just go back and let me just say, so social stats, Initially, he says, exaggerate. Then he says, underestimate. Now, without even reading the second paragraph, I know that the entire paragraph is going to be about how it is underestimated. So what I'm doing is, there is one part of my brain which is obviously reading it. See, skimming and skipping are two things. There is nothing like skipping. So I can't skip something. I can't say, okay, let me just not read second paragraph. Let me still go through it. The, un the unemployment counts exclude the millions of fully employed workers whose wages are so low that their families remain in poverty, low wages, and repeated or prolonged unemployment frequently interact to undermine the capacity. See, at this point, really, my brain is not trying to understand a lot of it because it does not really have the capacity to do so. Right? As I said, if you're able to understand all of this, you know what this topic is all about, great, right? Pat on your back, but really, there is no way I would have understood if I had read this. 
since the number experiencing joblessness yada 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 i go through all of this okay then in the end it says not does not necessarily mean that those failing in are adequately protected excellent i have understood nothing <laughs> when i say understood nothing all i have understood is he is giving me a bunch of reasons how social statistics underestimate the degree of <coughs> the labor market uh, hardship now i read the third paragraph it goes on to say it says as a result of such contradictory evidence is it contradictory sure it is contradictory right one ends up uh, uh, exaggerating the other ends up underestimating it is uncertain whether those suffering seriously as a result is in the hundreds of thousands or tens of millions basically the question that we started answering and then he goes on to say that uh, there is only one area of agreement in this debate that the existing poverty em employment and earning statistics which is in other words social statistics are inadequate for inadequate for one of their primary applications measuring the consequence of labor market problems basically he is saying that these are all inadequate so what i'll do i'll just go back and i'll just say therefore inadequate that's it this is how my map is going to look like 3 5 6 7 8 words in 8 words i have pretty much captured a summary of what i have just read do you realize that a lot of times i'm just reading through it not really trying to understand because what you have to understand is you will not need to know all of that right this is not a test of my intelligence saying okay can you tell me what it means if gmat were to test me on that maybe the technique that i will use would be radically different but gmat is testing me on something else gmat is just asking me based on this passage can you answer the questions now that we have known so much can we go back to the questions and try to see if we could have answered those questions so let's look at these questions right so the first one says um what is the principal topic of the passage so what is the principal topic of the passage we clearly know the principal topic of the passage is uh, that social statistics are inadequate to measure labor market problem because they either end up exaggerating it or they end up uh, underestimating it so whatever it is it is inadequate to measure labor market problems do you see just a couple of words that's all what that's all this whole passage is all about right so once you are given the five answer options this level of understanding should be enough for you to actually get to the right answer let's take the next one what does the author want to show by citing those who are repeatedly unemployed during a 12 month period now where does this repeated unemployment happen do you see this in the second paragraph over here repeated or prolonged unemployment frequently in track to undermine the capacity of self support so what you want to say is that and low wages somehow frequently interact to undermine the capacity to self support this is one example of how the actual labor market problem is underestimated see the whole idea is i know exactly where the answer is i don't have the five answer options but once i see the five answer options i should be able to get to the right answer choice because my entire focus is on that particular line let's take the third one can you suggest a proposal which best responds to the issues raised by the author so what are the issues he has raised if you see i just need to go to the last paragraph he basically says that i don't know uh, whether the problem is in you know whether the those suffering from the labor market problems is hundreds of thousands or tens of millions so this is the this is really the concern and he says social statistics such as uh, poverty unemployment employment and earnings are poor way to measure so what do you think the author is going to respond as a proposal he is going to suggest as a proposal something that uses more than social statistics see i don't know what it is i'll get to that when i get to the answers what i'm really trying to show here is all that you need to know in order to answer you probably already have with this first line of reading with this skimming and look at the last one according to the passage one factor that causes unemployment and earning figures to overpredict where is overpredict overpredict is exaggerate 
I know it is in my first paragraph. So let's see, it says unemployment does not have the same bleak consequences as it does in the 1930s when most of the, so you have un unemployment over here, correct? And the second one, when income and earnings were usually much closer in the verses. So this is the part that I really need to worry about, correct? So he's talking about unemployment over here and he also says earnings and income data over. So as long as I know where it is given, right? See, once I'm given the five answer choices, I'll obviously be able to figure out the right one. But at least I have enough knowledge to know where to go back in the passage in order to get to the right answer choice. That's all that you need to know. And that is the only way you can possibly read this the first time around in under two minutes. Now, did that give you a good sense of what mapping is all about or how you should be going about reading passages? Is this the way you read it? Was your map any different? I want you to think about all of these because as I said earlier, this is stuff that may not come to you very naturally. So you have to force yourself and stop when you are actually not able to understand things and move on, right? It, it doesn't come to us very naturally. The moment we read something and we don't understand it, what do we do? We typically stop, reread it, correct? A cardinal sin. Never reread unless and until is the first line, which means you need to understand that in order to move ahead. Or at some point, you just feel that you blanked out, right? Sometimes it happens on the test, you're reading a passage and you have read almost like, you know, a paragraph, but your brain kind of goes on a tangent. It starts thinking something else. And it happens, it happens to all of us, right? At some point, you may want to just take a step, step back, take a deep breath, say, you know what? I haven't understood. I've invested 25 seconds. Let me not go ahead. Let me just, you know, assume this 25 seconds is sunk cost. Let me get it out of the way. Go back to the first line, wipe the slate clean, start reading again. That's okay. But just because you didn't understand a particular line, like the line which says about unemployment or prolonged, uh, you know, unemployment, don't keep reading it and trying to, you know, figure it out in your mind. Chances are you won't be able to do so. So as I said, the big problem with regression is we tend to feel that there is something that we need to know and if we don't understand that, we will not be able to make sense of the passage. Trust me, I am going to sound like a shrink now, okay? But you need to let go of your fear of missing something, okay? <clears throat> you will probably never ever face a scenario where you have read something and that particular sentence was the key to the entire passage. And in any case, even if you feel that way, just tell yourself, no problem, I didn't understand it this time around. When I go back and I read it once more, when I answer the questions during scanning, that point I can read it and I can understand. At this point, you know, it's only going to have uh, diminishing returns. So reading it the second time is not necessarily going to help improve my understanding of the passage or that particular sentence. Having said that, what I told you, you are allowed to regress in one of two cases. Either you blanked out completely and you want to kind of wipe the slate clean, read it again. Or if it is the first one or two sentences. Why? Because the first couple of lines are, uh, you know, pivotal to your understanding of the rest of the passage. So I would kind of say, well, if it's then, you perhaps want to go back and read it again. So by now we have realized that reading in real life and critical reading are two different things, right? We are not going to be using the same skills that we use in, for reading in real life on the GMAT. If there is one thing that I want you to take away from this whole um, you know, session, it is going to be this. That reading on the GMAT is not the way, you would not do it the same way as you would read in real life. So what happens when we read in regular life? When we read in regular life, I probably am going to read every sentence on the GMAT. As I said, you know some sentences are more important than the others. So perhaps I'm not going to read all of those. So that's one thing. Second, in real life, I might look up for unknown words. On the GMAT, I'm not really bothered about it. I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, you know, read based on the context of what is given. Third thing, 
we always compare it to what we already know because the assumption is when we read something in real life, we are reading things that interest us. So we have a background, we have a context. On the GMAT, expect no such context. Fourth, we pause to reread complex parts. At least in my case, when I'm reading something really interesting and there is a complex uh, complex paragraph, I might go back and read it again, if nothing else to enjoy the beauty of the language. But I hope you are not reading on the GMAT to enjoy the beauty of the language. We are reading for one reason, that is to answer the question. And penultimate point, I perhaps know what the author is saying. I might have read his previous works. So I have a sense of where I, how I need to approach this. On the GMAT, we have no clue what the author's orientation is. And finally, in real life, it is the author's responsibility to ensure that whatever he's saying is clear to me as a reader. Whereas on the GMAT, it is his job to make things confusing so that I don't understand it. So what I do with critical reading is I change the way I read. In real life or in normal life, I might worry about dates, but on the GMAT, I am not going to worry so much about dates, but I may worry about relative numbers. The reason is GMAT would give you something which says, uh, post 1970, there has been a change in the outlook. And one of the questions would ask you about what do you think happened before 1970? Very clearly, the outlook was not the same. On the GMAT, the other thing that I don't need to worry about is words that appear only once, words that, you know, doesn't matter, it, it's just one, it's a one-off word. But if they are repeated and if they are defined clearly, I might want to know what it is, right? So I might invest some more time trying to understand that word on the GMAT. When there is a conflicting or a contradictory point of view, I don't worry about which one is right or better, right? For example, let's take the previous passage that we did. I don't really need to know whether social statistics are, uh, you know, a correct indicator or not. That is not what I'm trying to see. What I'm trying to see is what is the author trying to say, right? What are the two points he made? He made one was underestimating, the other is exaggerating. So we just need to make sure we understand that part. We understand what the issue is. And what is the solution? Not trying to see whether they are effective or feasible. For example, the fourth paragraph could have kind of concluded this way saying, um, that is hence I propose a new solution and he had given you a solution. Don't worry about whether that solution can work or not because what happens is on the GMAT, um, it's not your opinion that matters, it is the author's opinion that really matters. And um, if there is a list of things, if you remember Chronolizer species, there were a list of islands given to you, Jamaica, Puerto Rico and so on. You don't need to worry about it, right? But on the GMAT, many a times what may happen is they will give you some exceptions to the rule. They will say it is true for all countries except Puerto Rico. So expect something to appear on Puerto Rico or say which of the following cannot happen in Puerto Rico. So just think along those lines. We don't need to worry about specific details of theories, correct? But we need to just know what the author's opinion is about them, correct? So within those theories, I'm just saying whether the author agrees with those theories, author does not agree, I need to be a little conscious. And finally, don't worry about remembering the names and sources, just ensure that you're not confused whether something that the source is saying is being attributed to the author or vice versa. All right, so with that, we come to an end of the third part where we looked at how mapping can help us address the problems that we saw, the differences between reading on the GMAT and reading in real life. And we also took one passage and tried to hone our mapping skills. What we will want, what I want you to do is make sure that you go back and practice on the passages and try to ensure that you map each and every passage that you solve. In the next module, we will be looking at the basic types of questions on the GMAT and what our strategy needs to be for each one of them.